<gasps> Hello and good oh. evening. I know. Hi. Hi. Hey, camp followers. It's great to see you. Um, I'm very happy to be back. We have got a lovely guest this evening. Um, she is a lady that ruined my life, and I am absolutely adamant that I would be in the Caribbean drinking pina coladas, having a great time if it wasn't for this horrible woman. Um, so Julia is a dear friend of mine. She's also the founder of Garland Myotherapy, and I met her in 2013, I think it was. Something like that. It made me start looking at things very differently, and from there came Cam. So thanks, Julia, for ruining my life. No, I, well, sorry, I don't agree with you. And um, we're all the hands <laughs> around. It's an amazing thing you've done. And, Thank and you. I'm sorry you hate me. I don't hate <laughs> you. I don't hate you. But you don't well, me. so basically, let me tell you the story so you guys can understand why we're here tonight. So I'm a first opinion vet, and I've been a vet nearly for 19, about 19 years now. And I would have been qualified for about 11, 12 years at this point. And I can remember being in practice thinking to myself, I know that I can be doing more and I don't know what more is. I was very aware that we were taught the physiology of the heart and the kidneys. And I felt that we had quite a good understanding of the major organs. But I didn't feel that I knew very much about the biggest volume of the body muscles, soft tissue, ligaments, tendons, all of this mass in front of me. And at the same time, I was very aware that my, my verbal advice to owners would be, oh, he's probably pulled something. Let's rest up for you know a few days, lead walk for a few weeks, and here's some anti-inflammatory, and let's see how it pans out. And I was like, this ain't good enough. This ain't good enough. And I ended up discovering garland myotherapy now let me be very honest at first i was thinking do i need to go into physio do i need to do this what do i need to do and i heard about garland myotherapy and i was like right i'm going to go and see what this lady does i want to learn more and that's where you opened my eyes to what we're going to talk about tonight which is assessing posture and how much it can tell you yeah. and that's where my journey began garland brought much much more but we're going to try and define it down to posture tonight so you've already had somebody say thank you for inviting such a great guest julia wow thank you, wow. I'll talk to you later. thank you <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you do and then we're going to crack on and start looking at some slides together yeah i will okay thank you well i mean it's great to see you hannah and i i think if i can just go back to that last point about posture i think I remember very, very clearly a big moment for you when you correlated your own posture against the dog's posture. And I think that is the big moment for so many people when they actually can look at a, a four-legged animal and relate it to how it would feel for them. And I mm -hmm. think that's a really important transition to make, isn't it? To actually yeah. empathize with things like that. So yeah, I mean, Gala Therapy, we, we have... Um, various rationales for um, for treating and of course we um, our choice led treatment which is incredibly important to us positive pact so we use choice we assess via gait of course and posture posture is a big thing for us and as we develop more and more as an organization it's becoming more and more part of our training um, mm. because we realize it can really give um, another piece of that puzzle of assessing a dog and working alongside vets and our clients to actually perhaps offer um, a different perspective or an, um, um, another, um, another point of view towards a condition that maybe we are treating with them. Yeah, yeah. and I think, I think that's a very key point that you've introduced early and is the right thing to do is that this is a multidisciplinary team and people often say to me, are you still obsessed about arthritis? And I'm like, yeah, I really am. Cause it's huge. It's just like <laughs> huge. There's never ever going to be a day that I feel confident in this, in this area. Cause there's so much that influences the disease and the ways that you can influence the disease and etc. So anyway, what we were talking about just before we went live is that how, there are other people in the team that can influence um, 
how the diagnostics progress, how the treatment plan pans out. And what I feel as a vet is that we have got a lot of people surrounding us, therapists, physiotherapists, hydrotherapists, garland myotherapists, acupuncturists, who can contribute to the yeah. diagnostic procedure, um, implementing a really good management plan and treatment plan. So what I felt was really good tonight was I wanted you guys to go on the journey that I went on all those years ago. And we're going to keep it really, really simple. We're going to just start by looking at posture. We're not going to include behavior. We're not going to talk about treatment. Please don't think we're going to start giving you massage techniques and different things. That you can do. We're going to go right back to my very, very first um, modular course with Julia, <laughs> where all these light bulbs started going off because I was in a, a very vet way. And um, I think sometimes we can, as vets, be very vocal, very targeted. And we listen to what the client is seeing, and that tends to guide our examination. So when I was told to take a step back and look at the dog as a whole, it was a really big moment for me. So are you happy to begin? Let's go. I've got, I've got a roaming puppy at the moment, so you might suddenly see a face. <laughs> yeah, carry on. Okay, so let's get these slides up here. So what we're going to do, guys, is we've got quite a few slides to look through. And the reason that we're doing this is because there's going to be therapists, owners, maybe some vet professionals that are all watching this going, actually, this is really quite interesting because I've never really thought of it like this. As I said, as a vet, I was very much led by what the owner was seeing and what they described to me. And that would obviously influence where I was clinically examining and focusing my attention. So this was very, very good for me to step back and look at the dog as a whole. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. begin. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, trying to strip it down, really, because I'm a complete postural geek and I spend a lot of time studying these pictures. So I want to um, strip it down into basic elements so it's easier for people to follow and start to see. Now, you can see the two dogs on your screen now. They are fairly obviously compromised. Um, so if we look at the real extreme, then it will start you to begin looking at how a dog should look as opposed to how perhaps they shouldn't. So let's work it through. Let's look at their top line. So their top line is the level of their back. Now, if you look at this wonderful um, Labrador, this Fox Red Labrador, you will see that his top line is completely out. He's like Pluto. His back legs look higher than his front legs. And even though they are exactly the same length, it's how his body has changed to guard against um, a, a, a pain or a discomfort that he has, which has completely changed the, the shape and not the shape, the orientation of his pelvic region. So what's really interesting here is that you can see that his back or his top line goes up at the back, um, but his, his hind limbs look still well muscled, but we'll come back to that in a sec. Mm. So of course he's trying to guard something from his pelvic region. And so because he's having to guard and not use his body correctly, so he's not driving those um, appropriate forces forwards through the drive of his pelvic region, his front end is having to pick up that load and pick up that strain. So he becomes very front loaded. And I think most people understand that, that the front loadedness of a dog that is trying to, to guard the back end. But what's interesting about this guy is it's coming down in such an angle from his particular condition that actually it's having a big impact on his on his wrists. Um, I don't know if you can point to them for anyone that doesn't know. Ooh. Oh, can yeah. You, can, does it work? Can you see that? I'm not seeing it, but no. Anyway, um, apologies. Just up. It's it's hyper, he's hyper extended, so he's over bent on his front leg. There we go. That'll do. There, the wrist. So. He's hyperextended, so the load is coming down at such a force it is actually creating that hyperextension through his wrist. Now, if anyone um, does a lot of sort of um, work, Pilates work or anything like that, and you spend a lot of time on your wrist, 
you know that they can really fatigue. So that must be pretty uncomfortable for him. Yeah. Anyway, can we can we just um give people a quick understanding about normal weight carriage in each region and what each region does? Like really take it back to Penguin Book. So we're at 40% in the hind limbs, weight carriage, 60% in the forelimbs, back ends the drive, front end is the braking and steering. So people can understand that, you know, yeah. these regions have different roles. Absolutely. And the drive, as you say, should come from the back end, not just the drive. And this is also important, the brakes. The brakes mm -hmm. are the back end too. Um, and this is very important with a compromised dog like this that might be coming downstairs. They tend to come downstairs terribly quickly because their brakes don't work. Yeah. So, yeah, so the back end, the brakes, the front end, as you quite rightly say, is it, it, obviously it has drive, but it's more a direct, some directional um, apparatus. That's why they've got the lovely um, mobile front legs or forelimbs. So, so this guy, he is, um, he's got that um, tilt to his pelvis. Now, What's happening over his hamstrings, Hannah, if you can go down to his hamstrings, which are there, absolutely are there, they look really well muscled. So you think, well, there can't be much wrong with his back or hind quarters because they look really well muscled. What in fact they are doing, they are really congested. And if you felt those muscles as opposed to a really healthy dog's hamstrings, they would feel really quite solid and not in any way malleable and they're having to go and use themselves as a different role to actually stabilize and hold that pelvis in that position. I mean, this is, this is my opinion of what's going on because he's trying to guard some discomfort around that pelvic lumbar region. So he's mm. having to actually um, hunch his back like we would. We would walk differently if our, if our lower back or pelvic region was uncomfortable. So it becomes, a little bit of a strange story because the muscles look good but then what you've got to look at is the tail carriage and the tail carriage is very very low because of course the whole orientation has changed and when that orientation changes the tail carriage and the tail action can change too something we see a lot is that some dogs actually stop wagging their tail and it becomes insidious um, and people don't realize that their dogs have stopped wagging their tails. So I think that's a really good thing. Like, um, I remember, you know how when when I started Cam, I started having guilt, like terrible guilt. And I would phone Julia almost in tears going, I can't believe I've just never known this. And I, I had so many cases I could recollect that I hadn't acted upon because I just didn't know. And one of them was a dog where the owner came in and said, he doesn't use his tail anymore. And I can remember I was only about three years qualified and I just went, okay, I'm sure it's not a problem. I just didn't know. But actually, that was an indicator, which gives me a brilliant opportunity to say the reason that we're doing this, just to clarify why this is important, is arthritis is the biggest cause of elective euthanasia. We're pretty confident now. It's one of the biggest reasons that we electively, we choose to say goodbye. Mm. We know that arthritis is the leading cause of chronic pain, which is completely different to acute pain. It's a completely different thing. We know that it's a leading cause of suffering and long-term pain state, which causes the dog to adapt his posture, change its lifestyle, it causes emotional you know, suffering as well. So why are we doing this? Because posture could be the first hint that something's wrong to then allow further investigations to get back to what is the primary, which means that we have more opportunity to influence this disease. So posture is there as an opening, uh, a, a new early, early opportunity to say there's something not right. And it's also arrows pointing to where the primary problem could be. So I just wanted to remind people that's what this is about, okay? I mean, I see a lot of um, dogs and people say to me, well, it only just happened. They went into the garden and they came back lame. But when you actually look at the posture of the dog, it wasn't just happened. It had been going on for months or maybe even years. So these are, as you quite right, these are late 
postural changes. These are these have been going on for a long time, these dogs here. But all these start small and then they progress with it. So it is about, as you quite rightly say, it's trying to pick up on these things early and have an insight into what's going on with your own dog. Absolutely. Yeah. So, now we could we could spend more time on the, the the lovely gentleman here on the left, but if we move on, we can always come back and we can talk about other things. The thing that I just wanted to point out is the other mm. thing is the head carriage. The head carriage is another thing that we use, and you can see with this lovely gentleman on the left that he's got a very low head carriage. Now, if we go over to the dog on the right, another very extreme postural change, another extreme guarding action. And this dog has got exactly the same as far as her hamstrings are concerned, holding that dorsal pelvic tilt in, in that terrible angle. Um, but her legs have actually come backwards, whereas his legs have gone forwards. So I think really this is just oh, showing- that, sorry. Oh, Shepherd, sorry, back we go. My apologies. That you can't, every posture has to be taken on its own merit. You can't go, oh, well, that posture means that. It is an assessment of that particular dog and what's happening with that particular dog. So you can't say, well, I I would love to be able to say, well, that posture means that um, um, diagnosis for the vet and hand it over and go, well, that must be that. I've seen that so many times. It does not work like that. It is very, very individual to each dog. So it's a whole different way of looking at things, uh, things but with no um, condition attached. Did yeah, I and I think that's, a, that's great. I'm just going to butt in again because I'm just trying yeah, to get yeah. the relevance. It just, again, shows this multidisciplinary approach of you saying, this is the postural adaption. I would suggest there there's pathology likely to be coming from this region and it isn't actually saying well this is definitely hip dysplasia or this is definitely lumbar sacral or this is definitely you know osteochondrosis of the stifle you know you're not actually being specific you're saying my area of concern and that is brilliant because a vet like me who's in a time pressured consult in a very small box room with no windows with blood reports hospitalized patients surgeries to do to actually have somebody say you know, this is where the pathology is likely to be by looking at this dog's posture, because that dog is likely to behave very differently in the consult room. And yeah. the pressures of the consult room might not allow me to see what you've seen. So mm -hmm. we can collect exactly. yeah. to get yeah. to the right yeah. direction. But actually we do, is we don't even do that. We're, we are there to actually help mobilize the dog we are not there to work on the condition. The condition has got nothing to do with us. We are working generally on the results of the condition, but absolutely we can help dog by, by working on those compensatory issues and by looking at where they are um, wanting us to treat and not wanting us to treat, we can help direct, but we're not even looking at what the condition might be. We're looking mm -hmm. at elongating and helping more activity and better biomechanics within the dog yeah yeah and i think again we were talking again live do i need to say again again, again we were talking again. before we went live um that one of the things that you taught me right at the beginning and i never really understood it before this is that with time postural changes develop and they tend to progress so take me for example at the moment i'm at the laptop all the time my shoulders are beginning to roll roll over my back is beginning to curve i'm tight through my hip flexors now my hamstrings are you know not working because my quads are really tight and this has happened over time and i'm now having to unwind myself to try and get the posture and get rid of the discomfort that came with it and it's like peeling an onion. You're lifting a layer of change, a layer of change, a layer of change. And sometimes as a vet, it's really hard for us because we have these dogs coming pretty progressed and we don't know what the original thing is because mm -hmm. adapted and changed that they've now had the primary problem create a series of secondary problems. Mm -hmm. A spaghetti by that point, you know, where is, what, what originally started this? Yeah. 
So and this is where it works really well because we we like to say that we have great relationships with our vets. Obviously, we only work on veterinary consent, and we also work with only a, a limited number of treatments before we send the dog back if there's been no significant change. So we have a, a very close um, working relationship because we work within totally different fields. We wouldn't pretend to do anything else. No, no, it's complicated. So let's move on to the next slide. Here we go. Aha. So I just thought I would um, bring um, a German Shepherd in because poor guys, they do, they do suffer rather. So just again, it's the same thing again, but the, the top line might look straight or straight-ish, but wait until you get to that pelvic region and then suddenly off it goes. Of such an extreme slant. Now, even when you're looking at the breed as a young breed, they, they have got much more of that pelvic tilt than some other breeds. I, I understand that. But it seems that the way they are built, it, they do have this propensity towards going into this type of posture quite quickly. So they go into that very much of a, a tucked um, pelvic tilt. They're almost walking like humans on their whole um, um, planter surface. So they're almost down to their hocks sometimes. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, throwing the weight forwards into their, and you can see this dog very large over developed shoulders, um, which look disproportionately large to the pelvic region. Because of course, posture is all about balance. Everything's about balance, isn't it? And posture is about symmetry, um, symmetry left and right, and symmetry from the front to the back, as far as the percentage as you. Um, uh, pointed out the percentage of weight and um, that is proportionate within the body. But of course, you can see here that his head is, has got a very low head carriage. And actually, if you look at his neck also, that's also quite short. So everything on the body becomes- I think I'm doing a really good short. impression. Yeah, you are, you are. Thanks. But also, uh, I don't know if you can point to them, Hannah, the, the deep hip flexors too are incredibly short too, along with those hamstrings that now have actually pretty much given up working. There's nothing uh, there, love. There's nothing there. But I, you know, we know that German Shepherds get a lot of gracilis contracture and it does make me wonder whether that does go hand in hand with the posture because it can actually hold that position or help hold that position it's just a one of my observations um but anyway i think i think again if i'm allowed to do a tangent just to keep this all relevant and current and take you on my journey and i'm i'm not ashamed to say that i had a big learning curve um i very much was a vet that was still waiting for owners to tell me that there was a problem i was very much a vet that was seeking guidance for a change that the owner felt was very pertinent, was a problem. And I didn't feel at that point that if a dog wasn't kind of limping and really demonstrating that they were in pain, this posture was obviously of no problem to them. Mm. The dog came in for a vaccine and the owner said, yeah, he's been like it for years, doesn't seem to have a problem with it. You know, he's coping, he's fine, he's just getting old, he's just slowing down, but that's just what happens when you say that. I don't think I ever thought it. I would be like, okay, right, so let's get on with the vaccine because that's what you've come to me for. And now that I get it better, I realise that, that was my chance. That was my opportunity to say, well, actually, this postural adaption is probably because there's underlying pain and the postural adaption that's come as a consequence of that is also creating further pain. Mm. You would find as you touch these dogs and you learn how to palpate, you go, wow he's painful around his triceps he's painful around his pecs he's painful around his neck this wasn't the original problem the real original source of the pain might be in his hips lumbosacral region but now we've got two lots of pain yeah. we've got two pain and we've got a secondary pain and that's when you start realizing that you go yeah. i should be a long time ago <laughs> yeah. and that's 
words. I feel a lot of guilt that I didn't know. Absolutely. But this is where this is where the posture can really help you, isn't it? Because you can actually start right. He's compensating. Where? How is he? What is that compensation effect then having on his neck and his chest? But until you can actually identify it, well, not until, but it's really helpful to be able to identify that too. It's mm -hmm. it's a pieces of the puzzle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, I know that people always come on to Holly's Army and they say, I want to treat my dog holistically. And I'm like, OK. And then suddenly they drift straight into supplements and herbal and all this sort of stuff. And I'm thinking, no, you've forgotten what the meaning of holistic is. Holistic is treat the whole. The whole. And this is a example of treating the whole, you know, yeah. not just focusing, focusing down on the cruciate disease. We're looking at what the cruciate disease has also created. And let's undo that, too. Um, okay. Remember, posture is an indicator, but also it's something that might need treating because it's causing discomfort in its own right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's leave this little and move on to his feet. Now, I know you talk a lot about feet, so I just thought I'd mention basically anything that's going on in the body is going to reflect through their feet. And because you've got a small area to look at, it can be a little bit difficult but they reflect everything. So you've obviously got the nails and you've, this dog surprisingly has actually reasonably long nails on his hind toes. Um, and I would think that's more because of where he's walked rather than anything, because generally when the action isn't good, obviously the nails get worn out, but it's always the fronts that are interesting. I mean, look at that, they're, they're deviating out laterally so they're going out sideways, which makes them stronger. Um, we actually see a lot of dogs that use their elbows in their chest to actually give them a bit of support too, which then if they turn their feet out, their elbows come in. But also because the weight is coming forwards, it tends to be that they, they sit on their back pads and so their front phalanges or their front toes sit up a little. So the nails grow longer. And this is where you get this discrepancy between the front and the back, because actually the weight loading is creating um, more room for those nails to grow. And then, of course, the longer they become, the more difficult it is for the dog to actually take that stride forward. So it, the fronts are very, very interesting. You also see sometimes um, toes that are separating laterally or medially which means that they're taking more weight on that area. Quite often it's lateral. So the, the, the feet, the toes aren't staying together. They're actually separating. So whatever happen, is happening, going on in the body, it is going to come through the feet, but also the leg placement. We're always looking at where the legs are placed. Are the, the fronts shoulder width apart, sort of a good angle from the body, is the, are the hindquarters the same? Are they hip width apart and the correct angle for the body for the breed or the breed type? And, and when they just are standing in a relaxed pose, not a set up pose, are they four square? Mm -hmm. um, so it's these things, everything reflects through those legs. I can remember um, when I started and I was starting to do like case studies and um. I just didn't have right terminology. I couldn't. I couldn't get my head around what how to describe what I see saw. And I um, do you remember wonky table? Um, I used to always talk about wonky tables, and uh, <laughs> it was my only way of going. I know you. right, I but I have you. no way of describing it. <laughs> <laughs> but we understood. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We I had all manner of phrases. I also remember stiletto wobble. I had as well. Stiletto wobble was one. And of yeah. Course your so were also a, a one of joy, the Del Boy tuberosity. It, we oh, still yeah, because I can't remember. Yeah, we still <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, it's it's really important. Important. Yeah. yeah, well, I was talking to Zoe Belshaw, who is lovely. And I'm so excited to say she's going to come on live in the next few weeks, months. And she is amazing. And we were talking about feet today. And um, she was saying that she was having a chat with John Innes and we're talking that feet have had a lot of neglect. They, have, they don't feature in textbooks. Arthritis is always about the major peripheral joints and the, the phalanges, the interphalangeal joints are really neglected. 
Now, when yeah. you look at my dad, when he gets out of bed, what would be the first thing that he feels discomfort? It's often his hands. You see him try and warm up his hands and get them moving because they give him quite a lot of discomfort. So just imagine if these feet are actually quite uncomfortable as well. Yeah. We need to consider yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. move on. We can always come yeah. back if people want to look yeah. more. Um, the reason why I put this is, this is the same dog, but it's important if you are assessing posture to get the posture that's natural. And, and it's a lovely picture, the one on the left, but he's been asked to look up, which of course then creates a completely different posture with his back end. It's best to get it as natural as possible. As I said, no set up pictures. They need to be one that they're just taken as a dog sort of mooching around the garden or something like that for you to get if you're interested in looking at your own dogs for you to get the most accurate yeah one. and another thing that i see from this picture is that you've got the grimace on the on the right of a dog that's showing a lot of the world is upon my shoulders this is pretty hard work i'm tired whereas in the out environment with all the stimulus and the endorphins that are going off, the dog's facial expressions are much improved because of the distraction. Exactly. Exactly. So um, I think trying to take photos and videos for your vet, try and make them in the most normal environment, you know, the consistent environment as possible. Absolutely. We could get even more detailed than that. If you look at the picture on the right, you look at his eyes, he's trying to look up and he's having to look up, doesn't actually feel so keen to lift his neck up yeah. and that's in a sort of in repose that's in his natural sort of environment yeah it's all things like this that add to looking at posture because posture can cover so much can't it yeah yeah and it just highlights again that it is very difficult for vets in such an abnormal environment you know most vets are slippery floors high stress small room table in the middle no room to turn you know, there's a lot going on. So to get a true representation of how the dog is consistently, um, it would be better to arrive with maybe some video clips or some photos. So think about that when you're going to see your vet. I think photos show you so much. Now, this is a, a wonderful about slippery floors. This is a wonderful slippery floor for you. But I thought this would be another really good one to look at the top line. Because this dog's top line is different to the other dogs but look at that dip you've just passed over with um that is such an accentuated dip in the in this dog's top, um, top line but also if you carry on if you go further back Hannah go towards that tail that tail carriage again has been affected by the pelvic tilt that this dog has got different to the others as I said, they all, they're all they all different. This is what makes it so interesting. And look at how that hamstring is hanging on. You can see the light catching it. So it looks like it's a good condition, but that is really, really solid. You can actually see that that is giving that or trying to give that pelvic region some postural support, which of course, that's not what they're built for. Um, however, looking at all the other signs, the reason that that dip is there, in my experience, and I've come across this dip um, a lot, hundreds and hundreds of times, and each time I've come across it, it has been pretty much the same. It's when those deep hip flexors, that psoas group, is very, very short, and it, it creates a massive load on that middle thoracic region because that's mm -hmm. his point that's just my mm -hmm. experience um but i've seen a lot of this of that sort of dip and that that quite often there's corresponding heat that goes with mm -hmm. that but this yeah. dog is also front loaded different again short neck very short neck very wide stance in front to try and actually carry that weight and of course much narrower behind so again, a, a very different posture, very different posture. Mm -hmm.
The um, and I think again, this is an opportunity for me to just put a bit of reality. This dog will probably be walking around okay. The, the owner probably he's not that bad. He hasn't whined, he hasn't cried out. So he isn't overtly limping. So he's he's not really showing signs of lameness. And so these are the sort of dogs that are really existing and coping everywhere. You you start seeing them everywhere. But you as you look at their posture, you can start seeing that they're actually just holding it together is the way that I can describe it. They're just holding it together. And I think something that we see in the vet industry a lot is people that describe an acute destabilization. So the dog's suddenly gone off their back legs or they they've suddenly can't get up anymore. They suddenly don't want to go for a walk anymore. When actually the dog's been going, I've been telling you for years. Yeah. <laughs> I have screaming at you. There's something wrong, but you haven't listened. So, um, sorry, make everybody feel guilty. But uh, we love doing a lot of puppy work too, because it is about prevention, isn't it, Hannah? Really, that's what we would love to be able to do. But sadly, we've also got to work with um, conditions like this too. But it is, I think, more more and more people. I feel more and more people are are, are learning a lot more because there are more people out working with dogs. And in the nice. Mm -hmm there was no one else doing anything like this and it's great that there are more people doing things and there's a more awareness of what is going on with our dogs no i like it um kevin says do you know what condition the german shepherd was actually suffering from did they ever get a diagnosis with imaging etc no Not, they as far as i can remember um she said that he suddenly became really really uncomfortable and has slowed down very quickly yeah, yeah. i think that's a, another good tangent time for me to just talk about the reality of first opinion practice i would say that easily 70 percent if not more of the cases that i was seeing in first opinion practice didn't get a diagnosis so when we as a vet talk about a diagnosis that means that the history the observation the clinical examination which is a pain test neurological test and orthopedic test is completed with diagnostic imaging to confirm your findings and that's when you are able to make it a, a proper diagnosis of hip arthritis secondary to hip dysplasia or lumbosacral disease and hip arthritis when you can actually go this is what i can visually see that has changed on set x-ray ct mri but the problem is that doesn't happen in a lot of cases. Um, I'm doing a number of cases at the moment and not one of them has gone for imaging. The owner says, you know, the dog's 10, 12 years old now. I don't want a diagnosis, I want management. And um, that's where you combining your pharmaceuticals, maybe your supplements, your hands-on therapies, your exercise adaption, your weight loss, your home environment changes, I think in that situation you can bring it all together and say, I'm gonna give you some time, but we're gonna have a we're gonna have a line. And if by that point we haven't seen improvement, I really feel strongly that we need to get an answer. But if we have implemented these changes and we see a sudden improvement in comfort, posture, capability, demeanor, and we're like, we're actually doing really well. Do we need a diagnosis? It'd be lovely, but we might and our funds keeping going where we're going because we're going well so some a lot of cases a lot of cases don't get a diagnosis sorry kevin yeah and and that's another reason why it's really important that we as therapists work very closely with the vets because absolutely there are so many dogs that we see that don't actually have a diagnosis as such so we are working on them as from the compensatory side of things but we've always got to be aware that if things aren't improving that they will need further intervention to actually help them so yeah i we we see a lot that don't have imagery absolutely okay next one right so this is a very interesting little dog um very cute actually this dog is from china and is in china um and I just thought, right, when I first looked at that picture, I went, okay, um, the feet are hidden in the grass. And I just looked at it, I think, well, it doesn't look that bad. But then you start looking a little closer. 
And let's look at his top line, um, because this top line is completely different to the others. And if you look at his pelvic region, woo, it goes up in the air. It's mm. not tilting down, it's actually tilting up. And his head carriage is not great, it's not awful, but it's not great. And his tail carriage looks amazing. So I was looking at him, but then the deeper you look, the more you see. So mm. let's go back to that top line again. That pelvic region is actually, it's, it's got the opposite type of tilt. So it's all got a ventral tilt. And this dog did actually come with a diagnosis. And the diagnosis was that he's got some problem with his stifle. stifle. So I'm thinking that he's probably got some sort of instability in his stifle. He's very upright, isn't he? He's very, very upright. Very upright, such a classic little breed. And so when I looked at him for more, and then we'll look at more pictures of him because he's a, he's a he's quite an interesting dog from many perspectives. What's actually going on when what I see in in unstable stifles, try and get that out, is that their quads, could you point those out for me, thank Hannah? Yeah. Their quads actually shorten. And this is what I see a lot happen. And all those muscles on that side of the femur. Oh, sorry. Oh, whoa, we've moved. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, I still got him. They shorten because they're trying desperately to stabilize. So the only way they, they seem to be able to do it is to actually shorten. And what's actually happened with that, as far as I can see, is it's actually altered the, the, the lie and the tilt of the pelvis. So we've got the opposite happening here. We've got the, the quads or the muscles on this side, the, the sort of the nose side of his femur that are taking the load and the ones on the other side, which have actually got longer. So yes. it's a completely different view. And that's why I've now added the, um, the shepherd to show- Yeah, and it's just it's wide. He's really wide here compared to here. Really you normally see you normally see wide here and narrow there don't you but it goes on it goes on this is fascinating this one yeah his front's very narrow but also i've oh i don't know if the the bar the, oh there we go look at what's going on with his front feet too now a little mm. bit of history because again as i said no dog is the same because no dog has the same history and this little dog was rescued i think when he was two he had been kept in a crate or a cage most of that time, and he was also malnourished. And so one would also assume then he had very little exercise, if any. Now, his feet have taken on, we'll have a close-up of his feet in a minute, but his feet are really loading. You can actually see that his, his carpals, again, are under a lot of load. Mm. But when we look at his back feet, they are actually tilting up as well. So if you can have a look, the, the, the fronts are on the left of the screen and the backs are on the right. Wow. Look at how, it's a great picture. Look at the toes on the front. They've become very long. Now, one could assume that maybe that is because of the lack of exercise. And so they haven't, those tendons haven't shortened nicely. And of course, now they're under load, they, they haven't had that impact. I don't know, I'm just looking at potential. But the, the hind ones, look at that, the dog's hind left, so the right on the screen. The pads are up, they're actually up. So he's leaning on both sets or all four sets of back pads. Yeah. I, I don't see that very often, I just find that Fascinating, yeah. but not feet great. So much, don't they? Yeah, feet tell you everything. They really do, and that lateral deviation and and everything. There is just so much going on within mm. these feet. But yeah, but the fascinating, very odd. I think that's just got to be part of its history, really, rather than anything else. Mm. No, that's good. But um, just because I'm aware of the time, in that it's already to yep. to. It, it, should we go on to the next one? Yeah, we was, must go. And, we've got to follow up on this dog. This is very interesting. 
So, okay, Ooh. so that's more of a, um, right now, this boy needs to pee. Now, I think that the, the stifles must be bilateral and he only ever, all the video I saw, he only ever pees cocking his right leg. But look how unstable that left leg is. Mm. So I think that dogs pee or male dogs pee using the leg that they actually feel most stable on, not the most comfortable necessarily, but the most stable. So mm. he only ever uses that leg. So the other one must be so unstable. And if you remember that his front left was worse than the front right marginally, so you would think that that back right is not great. So it's that diagonal that's yeah. Really explain that. I don't think people understand about diagonals. Just no, okay. Perhaps I took that too far, but but <laughs> that's okay. We work in diagonals, or we like them to work in diagonals. So if a back left a back right rather is um, uncomfortable, more uncomfortable than the other hind limb, then the diagonal right or the diagonal leg, sorry, in the front will take up the load. Mm -hmm. So that diagonal working um, is very efficient for them. You see that a lot yes. when dogs sit, they tend to put their one front leg further forward, the one that they're going to lift themselves up, which tends to correspond with the opposite hind that's the weaker. And just taking it on a step with this one, yeah. just imagine a dog that's always been cocking his leg and he now feels unstable on, on either or and says, actually, I'd rather squat now. Well, that's the next thing, isn't it? Oh, oh, is it next? Should we, get, should we move on? Oh, no, no, no. I haven't got him squatting, but I have. Oh. I've got the thing is, when we talk about. No, oh, it's a beauty. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We, we look at postures that actually dogs adopt in their everyday life. So peeing is one, pooing is another. Now, I'm, I, I can't say her name because she would hate to know that everyone's looking at her having a poo. <laughs> it's it's your dog. dog. My it's dog. Your dog. Oh. Um, but for me, that is very nice. I mean, she's a, she's a lovely girl, obviously, but that's a nice balanced position. And of course, having a poo is incredibly important. So she's got that wonderful back that's almost perpendicular to the ground. Her neck is not overextended, but it's balancing her. Her hind limbs are nicely set apart and the front are not too far forward or too far back. She looks pretty balanced. She looks comfortable to have a poo. Okay, shall I move on to the next one? Okay. So there's a little dog that we've just been looking at having a poo. And I put the two together to try, not that Maggie is perfect, even though I think she is, but look at that little guy. How is he managing to have a poo? Um, now he has also, we, we, we've got our own comfort scale that we've put together based on just our observations over the years. And one of them is, does your dog have um, ongoing anal gland issues? And he does, and it just, makes you wonder if you can't have a proper dump then maybe that is going to have an impact do you know it's quite funny that once you put your poo picture up about 20 people just left watching it's almost like it's a taboo subject are they really talking about poo <laughs> We're talking about poo. I'm, you know I've, I've lived with poo all my life because of course i've, I've farmed i have horses it's part of life but it's a posture and it's one well, it's my poo really story. It, it's a really good one. My um, one of my owners sent me a photo of her dog's poo one day because she was so proud that he'd gone from doing the poo poo train yes. to have a place, and yeah. that showed that the dog had been able to hold a posture to complete a stool passage yeah. without having to kind of plod along because they didn't have the strength. We call them round bales, Anna. We call them round bales. Round oh, bales. I call them the poo-poo train. <laughs> well, you've seen the round balers, you know, during the spring and summer, weren't you? Yeah. yeah, so, um, and do you know what? I, I, I wasn't offended by such a lovely photo. I was almost quite happy for her. Exactly. It indicates better health. So there it does. Great. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. Right, now this one, I just, I had to put this in because... Again, posture is about how they lie as well, how they sit, how they lie, how they stand. All of it is still related to posture. So this is the same dog again. 
the same dog that a few slides back looks sort of okay. And this is a classic way that he sits so or lies down. So I looked at that and thought, I've really got to get to grips with this. So you can see that his back right is extended. So maybe it's uncomfortable for him to flex it under his body. And also the left is under his body too. Now, you would think that that left would be out a little bit further to help hold him upright in that mm. sort of sphinx type lying position. But it doesn't look like he can hold it there comfortably. So to hold himself upright, he can't, I don't think, hold his elbows wide apart because of the load going forwards, it can, the load can, it can go to both places, but it tends to go either above the shoulders or under the, the shoulders or under the, the forelimb. So it goes into the pecs. And with this dog, I think it's gone into his pecs because I don't think he can actually extend his elbows wide enough, comfortably enough to be able to support that position mm -hmm. down. So by tucking one under and then the other one over, he can actually stabilize himself in that lying down position. That's mm -hmm. how much geek I am. No, and I think it's fascinating because I can remember when I started learning about this, trying to unravel and I had gone for a, a walk and it was getting dark and I phoned you and had an epiphany moment going, <gasps> I've just I've just worked out that this does this that this that and that's why that happened and you were like, it's a great <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I'm hoping people find this as fascinating as I did as I I started and I hope people can understand a massive role that it can have in managing OA. I just keep wanting to bring this back to what we're all here about, which is yeah, our friends, catching it earlier and yeah. all influencing the different degrees of discomfort that come because of it and um i think hopefully a lot of people realize now that popping a pill just taking a supplement and changing nothing else is not going to be able to unwind this this has taken years to develop you can't pop a pill to take it away no have we got what, any more uh, what oh, sorry we suggest actually which might be as a good um a good hint anyone that's had their dog from a puppy if they've got a good picture of a side view of them when they're a puppy. I, I tell my clients to actually put that on the fridge or somewhere and then compare what they look like. So you've got the posture as they were and then you can actually look at any changes because these changes are so slow, aren't they? And so insidious that they're very, very difficult for us as owners to actually see them. So you need that sort of point of reference to check back on what they did look like. Mm. yeah no absolutely so let's move on because as i say i want to do 10 top tips um, oh, again you didn't tell me oh you'll be fine we've done it before spontaneous is always better okay let's go to this one. Oh, right now this this one's a very interesting picture i think i'm hoping by now that anyone that's looking can see that the top line is actually has taken on that same sort of position from the pelvic region um, and it's got that tilt um, and also the Y position as you were saying before that, that they tend to go wide or very narrow if they are compromised in the back end he's gone very very wide but also the front legs are quite wide too now this dog too was very you know very what? He's, he, he has got another leg there is another leg there but it's, just, <laughs> it's hidden Oh, see another picture. But this dog, the moment I saw that picture, I thought there's something not right about this. There is something not right about this picture. And I couldn't work out what it was. And they didn't know these people hadn't had him for very long. Um, this dog is 14. They've had him from a 12 year old, which I think they're angels for taking on lovely old dogs like this. Yeah. Can you go on to the next picture, Hannah? Because I yeah. want to get through a couple. And then I saw that picture. The one on the left, and I thought that there is something incongruous about that. And I will come to that in a minute, but you can see how he is. I mean, it, it's a, a phrase we use, which is a, a goat on a rock. So all four legs yeah. are really close together. But there's something still not right. 
So I looked at the top view because you can look laterally. Also, to look at the top view or the dorsal view is also very interesting. Now, it's very difficult to get a dog absolutely straight, but what's going on with this little guy is can you see around the, the lumbar region, the waist of the dog is shorter on his left side than his right side. So when he walks, he would slightly crab as well. So the, the legs wouldn't line up. They would be sort of half under his body. So it's worth looking at all these different angles and aspects of dogs to actually work out what's going on. So sometimes they look fine from that lateral view, but it's not until you actually look at them from the top view that you can see this asymmetry going on. So if you and I think... Go on, sorry. And, and then, yeah, just to butt in, again, looking at how posture can be an indicator, but it also can direct treatment. Mm -hmm. We talk about the multimodal approach, and sometimes I think it's helpful for owners to understand um, using different interventions to improve overall health rate related quality of life. And that might be that alleviating this dog's soft tissue discomfort actually could reduce his pain state by say 20 to 30 percent maybe I'm making these figures up mm. but for that dog that's a game changer Absolutely. and we talk Absolutely. about how weight loss you know um, yeah. I think it was something like six percent weight loss can dramatically improve pain state mm. well, you know all of these different things chipping away yeah. Louise Buck says marginal gains, you know, but if we can take this dog's soft tissue discomfort and reduce that, that dog might go, oh, I can cope again now. Thanks so much. Exactly. And I'm better. So just to chuck that in there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So this dog is very interesting. And I had my theories, but then this picture clinched it for me. The next one, I hope I've got my slides in the right order. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. I'm being, I'm being slack. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> Here we go. This one. Now, this one absolutely clinched it for me because when a dog is so badly compromised, which I think we can all see that this dog actually is, what happens is, and what generally happens is, their neck becomes very, very short because the neck and shoulders act as one to help pull them forwards. But this dog's neck looks really long and I thought there that's the problem there's the problem that is the incongruence he shouldn't but every other dog have such a long neck and then I looked at how he was sitting look how wide his front legs are in that sit mm. really wide apart now I've seen this a couple of times in dogs that have really really sore necks and quite often the necks are very sore, but they're quite short. But I think this dog uses his shoulders to pull him along and doesn't use his neck because his neck is too uncomfortable. And that's wow. why he's still got length, which um, because I they know that he'd had a bad accident at some stage in his past. And I think possibly this dog has had some sort of extreme whiplash where his back end has whiplashed and so has his neck. The classic running through the wood, running into something or getting impaled on something types. Did they ever get a diagnosis? Did they go further? I don't know whether they have. At the moment, um, they, he is responding quite well to some treatment, which is great. But I don't, I don't know whether they will go down there. But it's those front legs that really gave it away because rather than pulling himself up with his front legs and pushing with his back end, if he can, by putting his legs wide, he can actually sort of cantilever and swing forwards. So these sort of postures, this is, I mean, I find that absolutely staggering. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You start looking, we're not even going to go there, guys, but yeah. coincidence, and you start thinking, oh, very interesting what's going on there. <laughs> but we're going to, we're not, the bank with this because I know that there's probably some people just beginning to kind of take on board posture as a big indicator. If I go into coat patterns with Julie, you're just going to jump ship. <laughs> it's just too much, too soon. Yeah, we could talk for hours, but it, 
Yeah. Oh, no, I just can remember when I was learning with you, I had to go home at some point and just go, stop disrupting my thought process. You've, you've destroyed so much understanding that I had. I feel... I feel uncomfortable. I've, you've disturbed everything I thought was true. So um, I'd have to go home and then I'd come back um, kind of a little bit more relaxed. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I do. I do. It was, it was quite an experience for us too. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, let's move. Really the last one. Oh. Right. So um, you talk, I know, and I wanted to bring this in because, again, this is another posture of an everyday event. You talk a lot about um, food bowls and water bowls and the height of those, and also the surface that the dog stands on to eat. Now, this is again, that little dog that was lying funny and with the unstable um, stifles. Now, you can see very clearly that that bowl is at the wrong height for him because mm -hmm. it makes his posture worse. The big thing about food bowls and water bowls is if their posture improves, when you put it at a certain height. And again, there's not a height, it's different for every dog. That's when you know you've got it right. And so mm. I've got a couple more as an example, because I know, again, it's an everyday. Again, completely wrong for this bowl. But I think if everyone looks at that and thinks, right, if we just lift that bowl up to just above where his wrists are, just above where his nose is now, that's going to really, Strain off his back and off his back legs and he will mm -hmm. probably, probably plant his legs or feet in a better position as well as if on um again a bit of rug so he felt secure Dr. yeah Dr. and I, I think um, i can remember thinking about this saying to myself well we spend so much energy wanting our dogs to enjoy our food but we then make the process of eating so unpleasant really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. absolutely absolutely so again, this is interesting because I don't know if it's his position of his mouth where he's eating on this um, slow eater. I can't remember what they're called, but he actually, interestingly, and this is a guy with the, the bad neck, looks almost more posturally correct with it on the floor. Mm. But there are no rules, are there really? No, so no he does look more uncomfortable, doesn't he? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But Again, it's a posture. And I find that um, food bowls, eat, the food going in and the food going out are two very, very interesting positions. I think it also teaches you that um, something that applies to any therapy, any intervention, any pharmaceutical, nutritional input, nothing comes with a promise. And you have to look whether your intervention has worked. And this is something that gets really neglected. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think owners understand it is that it's all fair and well being dispensed something or introducing something now that it actually is working don't just assume so by looking at this and then looking at the dog going did that work for them did it make them more comfortable you could say well actually i'm not sure that this has no exactly and you've got to remember that the dog is going to demonstrate what they feel is correct mm. for them so they are going to give you the honest answer and generally, and that's one reason why I do love posture. Well, another reason is because you do get that almost um, authenticity of it because the dog is what the dog is. Um, mm. And it's it's reflecting their history and their condition and their, their, their confirmation. It's reflecting everything that they are. So I think mm. I've got another couple of pictures of, of food. Yeah, let's fly. we have to fly through just because that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, I've done that one now. That's good. Amazing. Amazing. There's a body condition score issue going on here. Well, I know. Again, you were talking about weight. I mean, I'm talking about load. So it would be <gasps> I know. I know. I did a Facebook live, guys, about weight today. Double whammy. Yeah. Okay, we're yeah. nearly at the end, I think. And this is this is the end. This is the last slide. Um, the reason we brought this up is that a lot of the, the postural um, assessments we do come from our distance support program. Um, and what, so, what was so wonderful for us is we've seen some wonderful changes. And basically, we're supporting people to treat their own dogs under a very, very supported program. Um, yeah. And this is the before and after of this. This is a poor little girl. 
she was a breeding bit. And, um, but I think everyone can see that after six weeks, we didn't touch this dog, but she was supported. The owner was supported by us to make the mm. change. Yeah, that is awesome. And I think, again, it's very, very relevant in today's world. You know, this new normal, which has been not very nice since March, I don't yeah. think it's going to go away quickly. And I think we've got to start thinking about how we can help dogs and their owners that aren't going to be able to easily access different services. So, no, it's very good. Right, let's get back on screen. We're going to go <laughs> screen. Yes. Right. So, guys, we've been chatting for over an hour. I know. And as I said, I'm just going to remind you, it's about us trying to identify the signs of arthritic change early. And postural adaptions is something that the dog will naturally do because they don't know that there's another choice. So they're just going to adapt their posture and get on with life. But it be a really good way for us to identify the signs of disease early, which then opens up a myriad of interventions. And one of the things that people need to know is you catch the disease earlier, there's a more likelihood you're going to get a better success rate, you're going to get better quality of life you might be able to explore interventions that don't cost very much money or they're very short term because you get a good response to them. But if we, if we identify this disease later and we've got loads of adaptive changes, we've got a high pain state, we've got a poor quality of life, our interventions are going to be less. We're going to have less success. And, you know, you can see why I want to tell you guys about posture. We'll talk about coping patterns. We'll talk about behavior. We'll talk about other things. Mm -hmm. We'll all see the importance of identifying this disease earlier. And then the second bit about this is that with posture comes another layer of discomfort. And we can influence that and improve pain state, which improves quality of life. That means that your dog is happier and you get your dog more years. That's what we're about. So I'd like to say a massive thank you for Julia for putting those slides together. Um, and now I'm going to put her on the spot with 10 top tips. <laughs> <laughs> 10 top tips for what, Hannah? Okay, so basically, as you know, my heart of heart is about treating and helping people with different financial backgrounds, different access points mm. to services. So 10 top tips is always about generally free of charge, yeah. intervention, that can help somebody look after their dog with OA. And I'm going to start, we always do number 10, and you'll do nine, I'll do eight, you do seven, I'll do six. Number 10, okay. Today I did a little video clip, please go and look at it. It's in this thread, it's teaching you to body condition score. Weight control, weight control, weight control is such a game changer, and we need to be taking it more seriously. You're going to the vet and you're spending money on pills, potions, and all bits and bobs. When actually we know, fundamentally know, that if you can reduce your dog's weight to an optimum weight carriage, it will influence pain state, it will influence progression. So you need to be pushing to get your dog at the correct weight. Number nine. nine. I'm going to go number nine. I'm going to talk about environment a lot, but I would say flooring is, it should be number one in many ways, but I'm going to say it now. Flooring. Um, I view walking on a slippery floor like ice skating and I don't want to be ice skating around my home um, and flooring is just I mean I know I'm pushing on an open door with you here because it's just so important it's something we've been saying for such a long time so yeah. um, and you can I mean my flooring in my home is wood but it's slippery wood so I bought mm. some very cheap and they, they just sort of blend into the background gray rubber backed rub rugs and they do the job they give the traction if a dog i'm going to be cruel play, here it's just it does say yeah that. i've had a lot of people say to me but i've just had that floor put down or i've just yeah. you know it, it, it makes the house aesthetics and stuff and I, I am a bit cruel now when i go and do my house visits and i say you'll get used to the sight of a rug, you won't get used to losing your dog. And that is the truth. You know, this is such a massive input yeah. that will really change the course of this disease. And can I tell you a little story? Diane Messam, my little hero, she's a physio from Davies. She put a slide up to yesterday 
and it had our oh, anti-slip tape and holly. Brilliant. What? Yes, Brilliant. so there is anti-slip tape, guys. Okay, number eight from that. me. I saw that. It's so important. It's so important. I mean, it's not. Yeah. I mean, let's just talk about health, but let's talk about money as well. I mean, the 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 cost of it is huge in veterinary fees, and who wants to? have to do that for a dog when you can prevent it by putting rugs down totally, totally. Anyway, number one in a way i think yeah well number eight for me again is something that you guys can all do tomorrow and um it was a massive difference to me and holly is don't feed them in a bowl anymore you know when holly was getting um more progressed and her condition was getting worse that was her moment of happiness in the day and it was over so quickly so explore what you can do with their food. They still have the same portion of food, but you can hide and seek it. You can scatter feed it. You can put it amongst stepping poles. You can take it on the walk with you. Expand its worth. Get them up, get them moving, get them distracted, get them engaged. Don't just think that you feed them in a bowl. You don't have to feed them in a bowl. Yeah, Number seven. Street search fanatics here. And especially if you can't get out in wonderful you can do enriched environments with treat searches it's fantastic absolutely mm. right i'm going to say the attitude. so let's go down please don't throw balls or frisbees <laughs> don't hide them i get a lot where my dog's obsessed with a ball i know that and you saw that picture of the the little springer there he that was the other thing I think that probably it's exacerbated his position from his previous home. He ha he was obsessed with the ball. Hide it then. So they mm. have their nose, they're having to engage all their other senses um, to actually do it. But also to have their nose on the ground finding things is very good for their posture. Mm, good one. I like that. Okay, yeah, number six. Where that came from. I'm only on <laughs> eight. Oh God, I've got some thinking time. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> So number, I'm on number six. Six is going to be nails. Then so we started touching on foot care. Again, I, I just, I didn't realise. I was a vet for 10 years without realising how important nails are. When I started reading more about it, how much discomfort can come from overlong nails. So it's a horrible negative cycle. Poor posture because they're trying to protect something causes them to maybe rock back. The nails have more ability to grow because they're not getting engaged in the ground. That means that they're longer. So when they do engage in the ground, they bounce back and hit P3. So they've got the reverberation against the bone. But they're, you know, ow, 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 ow. Try and keep your nails short. Um, a lot of people say, oh, but his quicks are really long and I can't cut them short anymore. By keeping them short, you're going to get that quick to recoil. So keep them, keep going, just keep going, just keep trimming them back, emery board, emery board. The quick will want to, to sink back into nail. You'll get there over time. So do think about nail care and think about the fur in between the pads. Do not shave it against the skin. I don't want to see anybody parting the pad and getting in there. No, you're going to get clipper rash. You don't need to do that. You just need to make sure that the pads are able to cut contact the ground without hair in the way. And think about the hair that comes from here as well, behind the stopper pad, and it flips over the main pad. Trim it away, trim it away, have pad contact. Number Anyone five. Of course, his knows all about nails and break over, how important it is, it's exactly the same. Yeah. It? Yeah. Okay, five. I've got such a good one. And again, <gasps> we, should, we, we should have so many number ones. Um, please don't let your dogs pull on the lead yeah. whether it's a collar or a harness their whole posture changes when they are leaning into a harness or a lead they rotate their legs laterally it's just go and find a good dog trainer mm -hmm. it's it's huge huge that yeah I think that's a really good, I'm going to take that into four as well. I'm going to drag that into four. When I do my like pain consults and stuff, I know when I start saying this behavior, this habit, this routine is contributing to the problem. You can see owners go, no, I don't, I don't want to involve anybody else. I just want to fix the problem. You're like, well, you're not going to fix the problem until 
that habit, that routine, that behavior is also changed. Somebody else that belongs in our multidisciplinary team is the behaviorist, is the doctor. And I'm going to sneeze one minute. No, I'm not. But, yeah. but they are part of our multidisciplinary team. So as an owner, please do me a favor. Don't go in like this, never minded mm -hmm. and blue. I think it's just going to be a quick fix. Have a wider view because yeah. having somebody help you stop your dog pulling or jumping in and out of the car or and chasing. It's hard. it's hard. Yeah, very hard. But the long term benefits, it's yeah. good investment. Yeah, yeah. But I've just Number three. Watching, watching my puppy pull on the lead, her whole body changes. It's yes. scary. It's it is scary. scary. And that is going to set up a trend for the rest of her life. So it's one of the most important things I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm very lucky. Luna's on the lead a lot. But as you say, when she's on the lead, she starts pulling. We're like, we're not going anywhere. Until yeah. you say, we're not going anywhere. Absolutely. Number three. Was that me? Oh, no, you've, you've just... Done. You're number three. I didn't know before. You're number three. Okay, let's just stick with the same thing. Um, harnesses are great. Love harnesses. But make sure it's a good one. Please don't mm -hmm. impact their shoulders. If the, any that go across the front of their shoulders might look cool, but they're restricting them. And if you're starting to restrict their movement before you even start, that is going to have a long-term impact. So make sure it's not rubbing under their um, elbows and under their arms. Can you imagine having that something rubbing under your arm the whole time? So make sure that your harness is fitted properly and it doesn't dig in their neck because it can actually be almost worse than a collar if they're badly fitted. Definitely so good one. There's lots of advice on buying good and getting good harnesses. Yeah. Okay, number two for me, as I say, none of these are costing we're not talking about drugs we're not talking about supplements interventions we're talking about things that you can do tomorrow being in the car like so people talk about jumping in and out of the car yeah we don't want you doing that but also i can remember watching my lovely holly she lost the strength to stabilize so she lost the ability to deal with the corners with the brakes and she would be like a pebble bouncing in the back of the car so having um bolsters so there was cushions that she could lean her shoulder into and stabilize so that car journey wasn't hard work now if you can think about it if you've got pain and you're being forced to do movements that you can't resist that's not going to be very pleasant and our car journeys could be quite long I did a lot of driving back then and I wanted her to be comfortable and as soon as we had good bedding and something for her to lean into I could see that she relaxed and she slept Otherwise, that whole journey, she just was having a terrible time. So think about your car. Very, very, absolutely. Okay, so you've given me... Number one. Number one. Well, I think that there is only one number one. Well, there are lots. But the biggie is dogs were not designed to live in our houses. Yeah. They were not designed. Their, their functional anatomy is not built for houses. So it's mm -hmm. not built for floors. It's not built for um, running to the front door when someone arrives. It's not built for jumping on and off furniture. It's not built for that. It's not built for being left for a long time and then being taken for a very long walk. That is not how dogs operate. So mm -hmm. think more about how what a dog is designed for, their body, and also how they would behave more in the wild as far as activity and exercise is concerned. Mm. Huge, all of those are big subjects, but they mm. have a big don't they? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And I can remember um, when I started having spent time with you and I started the home service and going and helping people as a vet, my therapist, occupational therapist, everything in one. And even just getting these dogs up and moving on a regular basis had a massive impact on their quality of life and yeah. over time you could see that their pain state started to decrease their strength their stamina their coordination improved and i can remember one owner she used to allow her dog to sleep in she thought it was the right thing to do because the dog was painful and older and she said oh I'm, i just let him have a lay in and i was like oh, no no boot camp here when you get up you're going to get your dog up and you're going to go in the garden, take some biscuits and get that first lap of the garden, get some movement. Dramatic change in that yeah. dog. 
yeah. her after because actually the dog was I don't want to get up I'm sore I don't, I'm just going to stay here so big big hopefully before that do you remember because we did go to India together didn't we doing that wonderful um street dog study that we were doing yes. how little they actually walked and they ran I think they did half a kilometer in one day didn't they that was yeah awesome. the rest was sleeping playing uh, messing around with the dogs and 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 sort of doing hunting and that sort of thing so yeah that it's it's about the the old weekend warrior and it's lovely to yeah. go out dog but leading up it's one way of hopefully preventing surgery um, yeah definitely starting definitely so if there's any country in the world that want me and julia to pop by and just have a little <laughs> a little working holiday we're totally up for it oh, absolutely we're a bit closed at the moment but we'll have to attend <laughs> yeah, we're thanks julia you've been fab you know you've managed to engage we had about 150 60 170 people at one point listening so that was really really good we've really run over we've really that's so like it's one of those things well, anyway I, thanks guys i want to say thank you and thank you for cam thank you i i, I don't care that you blame me i just it's the most amazing <laughs> organization it really is and the dogs need it and the dogs need you so yeah keep going. we're all behind you but yeah, so yeah, please support Cam. Guys, buy these hoodies, buy the yeah. beanie, buy the bum bags. Please, we've got all our booklets are now PDF. You can download them immediately. They're 99p each or the whole set for 9.99. We're completely self-funded. You know, this is um, we do not get any charity funding, we don't get any support by industry. We do this all ourselves. By you buying some stuff from the Cam online shop, it makes a massive difference. I'll put a link. I'll put a link to Garland. Um, we'll put a link to the distance support. Um, I'll put your email address or the Garland email address for people that got Garland, yeah, that'd be lovely. The mail app. Cool. And if you want Julia to come back, then you need to write below and say what you want, and we'll see what we can do. Lovely. Well, I hope cool. everyone a reasonable evening with the fireworks i hope their dogs are not being too upset i've been on slight tender hooks waiting but so far so good here so far so good good so far, so good. Right, guys we're gonna say goodbye bye bye bye